Hello and welcome into BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Root of BTN. This week's guest is former Ohio State basketball player Joey Lane. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh, my goodness! What a catch! Oh, Energy. my goodness. Enthusiasm! Joey Lane in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsor, Northwestern University's School of Professional Studies. If you've ever thought about a career in sports, check out the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. You can build your skill set and your network in evening or online classes. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. Now, Joey Lane. All right, I'm very pleased to be joined by former Ohio State Buckeye basketball player, very well-known walk-on to scholarship guy who goes by Joey Smoke 14 on Twitter. It's Joey Lane. Joey, what's up, man? What's happening? Pleasure to be on. Excited about this. Yeah, glad you're glad you're joining us. And you know, before we even get into some hoops talk and and you know what you've been up to as far as uh, the basketball landscape goes. Let everyone know, you know, what you're doing professionally, because I noticed your Twitter header, you got like the private jet set up going in your, in your header. And, um, you know, I figured you're in the corporate life like the rest of us. So, so what's been going on, man? Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately a lot of guys, uh, aren't able to go pro in the sport that, uh, that they play in college. So that, uh, same thing happened to myself. Uh, wasn't too, uh, excited about trying to pursue professional basketball, um, probably because no one wanted me, but also because I made it's my choice. It was my choice to not do it. So, um, yeah, I work for a, a company called NetJets that's actually based out of Columbus, Ohio, um, doing some sales for them and, and having a blast um, being a, a regular old adult with a nine to five job. Well, welcome to that lifestyle. Um, you know, it's not as bad as I make it out to be, but are you in Columbus still or are you uh, back in the Chicago land area? Yeah, so um, technically, yes, I'm in Columbus, but as it stands right now with the pandemic and the world being the way it is, uh, I've actually come back home to Chicago to, uh, to quarantine with some family. So I figured that was a better idea than being all lonely by myself. All right. We'll talk some Chicago stuff later on because uh, you know, the network obviously is in Chicago. Um, there's plenty of, plenty of discussion to go around there. So I'll, we'll come back to that. But uh, I've noticed you're also in the podcast game too. You know, you host a drive the lane podcast, but you also host a podcast for the upcoming uh, TBT tournament, or uh, I guess just the TBT, short for the basketball tournament, which gets underway starting July 4th, uh, Nationwide Arena in Columbus. So how did you get involved with the whole TBT? It's something that I've followed, you know, over the last several years. And, and obviously it's, it's an awesome event for Big Ten fans because so many memorable and uh, familiar faces are in it. Yeah, so my first contact with uh, the TBT was um, by Dan Friel. So Dan is one of the co-founders. Um, of the of the tournament and he reached out to me my my it was either my freshman or sophomore year I think it was my freshman year in college and said hey Joe um, through a mutual friend um, hey Joe can you uh, help us get an Ohio State alumni team and I I didn't tell this to him but what I'm thinking on the inside is I just stepped on campus um, how am I going to call Jared Sullinger and Aaron Kraft and tell them to make this team um, when I've never met those guys ever they to me they're still my idols like um, how, how am I going to shoot them a text and say, hey, you don't know me, but I'm going to set this team up. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. What I told him was, I don't really want it to interfere with either my school, my basketball, or my eligibility. Um, so I'm going to have to pass, but I would love to help in any way, shape, or form um, if the opportunity ever presents itself. So fast forward to two and a half years from then, um, Ohio State makes, um, they make a team with the help of Scooney Penn and some other guys uh, that we come to know as Scarlet and Gray. Um, they, the Scarlet and Gray team, they have their own regional in Columbus, and obviously I want to be a part of it. So they asked me um, if I would help run the social media accounts for them uh, and, and come to the games and tweet live stuff and just get Buckeye Nation all excited about it. And I was more than happy to do that. So I did that for um, the past two years. And then this last year um, was just a fan, was able to go, um, because the championship was in Chicago, was able to go and, and uh uh, be a part of it and, and, and hang out with the guys and just catch up with all the TBT 
um, guys that, that I had met along the way. And, and that was a blast. So um, once I got onto the professional podcasting scene, um, we wanted to have Dan, the co-founder, on to um, talk about Carbon's crew, but also talk about the TBT and, and see where they stood in terms of being the first sport or sporting event to, to come back um, with, with the coronavirus and everything. So um, after we talked to Dan on Drive the Lane, which is the Ohio State theme podcast that I co-host with my buddy Andrew, um, we, we pitched him the idea of, hey, the TBT is awesome. What is it missing? It's missing a podcast. Like, you know, every, everyone's got a podcast. You guys don't somehow. Um, here, here we are ready to, uh, ready to help you out in whatever way we can. And they loved it. So that's where, that's where we came in. Yeah. And it's wild because, you know, we're previewing this and you guys are talking about it and you briefly mentioned it there, but like, it hasn't really sunk into me that like basketball is coming back. Like two weeks from now, we're going to be watching basketball, you know, fingers crossed. And, and it's just wild that the TBT is going to be the first event really to come back with live basketball. It's going to beat the NBA. So I just think that's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, the TBT is awesome as it stands without being the first person, having a normal tournament, all that stuff. It's awesome. And if you don't know about it, um, you're missing out. And so now um, it gets this incredible stage, um, like you said, before the NBA comes back. And it's really going to be the f first sports that people beyond golf get to kind of, you know, just absorb. <laughs> and, and that's what people have been missing for so long. I think it's just going to catapult it into just this awesome, awesome event that, that some people have never seen before. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, so let's talk some TBT. I mean, you mentioned Carmen's crew. Uh, who are the defending champs. And, and Columbus has always had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, some pretty deep ties to this event. They, they host quite often. Um, you know, so it felt kind of natural that last year they were able to, to win it all with, you know, a, a really familiar and, and great collection of players. I mean, I know they have Aaron Kraft on the team, John Diebler, I believe, and, and a lot of those other guys from the uh, late aughts and, like, early 2010s, I, I think. So, uh, what do you know about kind of how that team came together? I, met, I heard you mention uh, Scooby Penn built the Starling Gray team, but how did, how did this collection of guys get together and, you know, I guess ultimately um, bring home the, the million or two million in, in the title last year? Yeah, you know, it was so easy for them. I mean, those guys had been friends, um, you know, since they were in school. Obviously, they were best friends while they were in school. And then every summer, all the Ohio State alumni, all the basketball guys are all back playing pickup, working out together like, they, they never missed a beat. So when they were presented with the idea of making a team again, putting on the Ohio State uniform again, playing in front of Ohio State fans again, everyone was, was, in, was excited about it. It was a no-brainer. So, yeah, the team has basically stayed the same since they came in. I mean, Jared Sollinger went from player to now he's the coach. Um, but beyond that, it's been the same core group of guys. They add some guys here and there um, from different schools, but they're all um, – tied to Ohio State in some way, whether it's they're from Ohio, from Columbus, or in the case of Demetrius McKamey, um, he's Evan Turner's best friend from high school. So um, every, everyone is, is kind of um, tied to Ohio State or Columbus or Ohio for whatever reason. And it, it's just until those guys literally can't walk, they'll, they'll be playing basketball and they might as well be in the TBT together. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned uh, McKamey. So – I went to, uh, went to Illinois and grew up a Illinois fan and they finally have a team in the TVT this year. I was wondering when they would put one together and they finally do in, in the house of pain squad. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little upset because their, their second round matchup, Carmen's crew gets a bye, I think. And it's their second round matchup would be with Carmen's crew, the defending champs. So like if Demetri McKamey torches the house of pain team and knocks out, uh, knocks out the Illini alumni squad, it's going to be, you know, some, some bittersweet, uh, poetry there. But, um, Speaking of that, do you know the – I think he's the coach of the House of Pain team, Mike Latula, because he's a, he's a former walk-on like yourself. Yeah, so Mike actually is – he grew up 20 minutes from me. He was my camp counselor at a camp – or his older brother was um, back, like, I mean, 15 years ago. So I've known Mike for a long time. We played AU in the same program. Uh, he was just the ultimate stud in high school. I mean, he was so darn good, and nobody seemed to notice, which was crazy. But – um, yeah, Mike's been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, really, really excited to see him as like a coach GM instead of a player. Um, but yeah, he's put together a pretty nice little squad. I know that the TBT, it's, they all, they're all about the storyline. So of course they're going to put um, Carmen's crew against um, uh, the Illinois team if they win, just because number one, big 10 versus big 10. But then number two, it's, I mean, it's Dimitri McCamey versus the other guys. So 
uh, it's all, it's not an accident that those guys are, they might, they might face off in the second round. Yeah, Mike uh, was my neighbor in college for, I think, three years. So I got to know him decently well and the rest of those guys. It's going to be fun to see them take the floor again. Um, and then besides, you know, those two Big Ten teams, there are a couple other, uh, you know, Big Ten-related teams, and, and they're competing against uh, a variety of, of alumni teams and overseas players. Uh, what else jumps out to you, you know, from the bracket that was just released this week? Any other teams or noteworthy names you're going to be looking at? Yeah, I think in terms of Big Ten teams, obviously there's a – the Big X, which is a Big Ten alumni team from all different schools. Uh, that's where my allegiance lies most, I would say, just because a lot of those guys are my teammates. You know, C.J. Jackson, Andrew Dockage, Keyshawn Woods, the list goes on and on. Um, and then, But then they add guys like Nick Ward and, uh, you know, a bunch of guys from Wisconsin, Khalil Iverson, Vito Brown. They have a collection of some of <laughs> the best players from recent years. That'll be a fun team to look at because they're really young. And young teams haven't done well in the tournament before. Um, some other teams that um, have nothing to do with the Big Ten that are going to be fun to watch are these teams that are like all-star teams of overseas players. Uh, so those are teams like Overseas Elite, who's won it nine out of the ten years or whatever it's been uh, that the tournament's been out there, uh, which they've only lost one game, and that was the Carmen's Crew, uh, of course. Um, but, you know, teams like Team Hines, which is – Again, just an all-star team of overseas guys that includes Brandon Paul, who is not on the Illinois team. So that's another name um, from the Big Ten that's not playing with his um, alumni team for whatever reason. Um, but, yeah, just teams like that. Floyd Mayweather has a team. I mean, that's going to be so fun to see. Uh, it's another collection of just absolute studs um, that have had um, stints in the NBA but primarily made their money overseas and stuff. So, uh, it, if you like I said before, the, the tournament's all about storylines. And, and there's just – every team has some incredible talent, former NBA guys with incredible storylines. And, and not only will it, has the pandemic, you know, made it so this is going to be the first basketball we've seen in a while, but because the NBA draft hasn't happened yet, isn't it true that guys that, that would be in the draft this year um, are eligible to play? Like, I think I saw Caleb Weston is on a team. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, just today, I think, Everline Drive announced that – um, they're, they're signing a guy from LSU who just graduated, who's in the draft. Um, I mean, and, and it's just like, it just adds this whole new dimension to the TBT as, especially for this year. I think even in, in a normal year, um, it can add a dimension where kids are declaring, maybe they have some eligibility, but they're playing in the TBT to showcase their skills further to NBA scouts and overseas scouts too, because it, it's, it's happened where guys have played really, really well and they get an NBA contract or guys have played really, really well and they're making a great living overseas, all based on how they do in the tournament. So um, it'll be a new thing to kind of watch out for because in years past, um, you know, there'd be plenty of guys um, who, tr who use the TBT to try and catapult themselves into professional basketball. But now it's, okay, I could go back to school, but instead I'm going to first and foremost have a shot at winning a ton of cash. But then also that the byproduct of that could be, uh, me um, leaping up NBA draft boards. Yeah, it'll be fun to see. Another wrinkle that the TBT has legitimized is the Elam ending, and I'm not articulate enough to explain exactly what that is, I don't think, but, you know, instead of a timed ending, it's you're playing to a score. And it was crazy because, you know, I'd seen it in the TBT, but really, like, what took it mainstream, I think, was the NBA All-Star game this past year. It was awesome, and everyone agreed that, that the NBA All-Star game with their – I think they did it for each quarter – was incredible. So that's just, you know, that adds another layer of intrigue, I think. Yeah. The Elam ending is, um, it's not for everyone and some people don't love it, which is fine. I think just what makes it so special is that there, um, you can't argue with the fact that it makes the game really, really exciting at the end. Uh, it's, it's a wrinkle. Like you said, it's something different that puts TBT um, in a different realm than some other tournaments or events that are going on. So I think that's just another added component that makes the TBT so special. And, and the Elam ending the easy way to explain it is um, at the under four timeout, when the clock first stops under four minutes, all you do is you add eight points to the team that's leading and whoever gets to that score first wins. And it's, and it's makes it so it's like kind of like a pickup game where you're playing to a score, but at the same time, there's so much strategy that goes into it. Like, do you call timeout so that you can get the target score what it is now? Um, you know, do you, if you're up, if you're down um, three, uh, and they have the ball, do you foul so that they have to shoot free throws so they can't hit the game-winning shot? You know, or if you're um, 
up three and you have the ball, do you try and go for a three or do you try to, you know, get a layup and then have to score again? It's just, there's so much that goes into it. And, and the TBT has done such a good job of promoting it and making it sort of like the face of the tournament. And, and it's just really, really cool. Yeah. And the last thing about uh, the TBT before we move on, it, it's just, I think it's great that you have this as an option in the summer. And I also really enjoyed the, uh, the th- I don't know how you, what the official title is, but the three X three tournament. Uh, that's usually around the final four they've done the last couple of years where um, it's just three on three and they're also playing for money. And, and it really gives, like we talked about fans, a chance to see players that you might otherwise lose track of, right? Like you don't get to see play again because they're not quite good enough for the NBA and they go overseas and, you know, you don't really, really hear about them, but um, the three on three one is outgoing seniors. And then this one, you know, you might see a guy, like a Brandon Paul, who you haven't seen play since he was in the NBA a few years ago. So, um, I don't know, it's just a lot of fun for me as a fan to watch. Yeah, I think the coolest thing about the TBT, and I say this all the time, is that it gets these former players a chance to come back, represent their their university, play with guys that, that they, you know, went to war for with sometimes four years, um, and then in some cases play in front of fans um, that, that have missed them, exactly what you're saying. So, um, the fact, the idea that Aaron Kraft, you know, can come back, play in Columbus in front of fans and people get to see him wearing Scarlet and Gray again when they haven't seen him play in 10 years, you know, or something like that. That's the coolest thing about TBT is exactly what you're saying. Getting a chance to see these guys who you haven't seen in a long time. Getting, getting, getting to lace it up again. All right, Joe, we've done a great job uh, gassing up the TBT. Excited to, excited to check it out here in a couple of weeks. But do you want to talk about uh, yourself and your background a little bit? Because it is a, it's a pretty cool story. Um, so just looking through your bio, and I think I knew this when you were playing, but you are from Deerfield, Illinois, correct? Yeah. North, north suburb of Chicago. And, you know, it's funny because Deerfield got more exposure in 2020 than I think it's had in probably 22 years with, with the last dance coming out. And, you know, I, I was a little – because that's where the, the Bulls practice facility was, if people don't know. But um, I was a little mad, you know, watching it, just frustrated because – in my mid twenties, you know, I'm not old enough to remember watching the nineties bulls, but it's funny. Like I, I just heard a lot of uh, current sports media members sharing stories about like growing up in the North suburbs or in Deerfield and seeing like Horace Grant or whoever at, at Baker square in Deerfield. So I don't know if you had any uh, memories, like maybe if your parents or, or uh, you know, friends or family members had any bull stories, but uh, I have to imagine it was cool uh, seeing some of that old footage. Yeah. I mean, it was really cool seeing the camera, the, I mean, the whole world was focused on Deerfield for Michael Jordan's press conferences and stuff like that in itself is really, really cool. In terms of like specific stories, um, I used to go to Bulls Sox camp, which was in the Birdo Center where they practiced and stuff. So like that was really cool, but it wasn't when those guys were playing. So they were never around or anything. I mean, the coolest part about that was I was at Bulls Sox camp when the Bulls signed uh, um, Ben Wallace, which was at the time a big deal. And then it turned out to not be at all. But um but yeah, that's, that's one thing is that I grew up playing in the Birdo Center like it was like, like it was nothing. And then also, as I got older in junior high to high school, where I trained and worked out was actually um, there, there. That was the practice facility that they had um, back in the days, which was the multiplex, which is what it was called. So um, <laughs> that was literally when you're seeing like the practices and everything like that, that court still has the Bulls logo, the championships, everything on the court. And I used to practice, anyone could just pay $10 to go shoot around there. Like it was just a health club, you know? So um, that was, that's really, really cool. The one specific story that my parents um, share with me is that my mom, uh, she worked for the company that made um, the Larry O'Brien trophy. Um, So with her being in Deerfield, when the Larry O'Brien trophy was, um, when their sixth championship trophy was at the practice facility, uh, it broke. Um, So it, and I don't know if it broke. She, I don't know. She changed the story like every time, but it could have broke. It could have needed to be like buffed and shined, whatever. There was something wrong with it or not perfect with it where they actually told her to go pick up the trophy. um, And it actually sat in our house for a couple of nights um, before she drove it back downtown to get cleaned and stuff to bring it back. So um, my house actually, which I'm sitting in right now um, has had uh, the bulls six championship trophy sitting on our kitchen table before. See, just so everyone knows, we did, we did not go over these questions beforehand. Like, I just knew you being from Deerfield and hearing all these stories that you might have something. That even exceeded my, my yeah. expectations. So I just awesome. learned that during the last dance. So, I, I mean, I don't know how my mom skipped out on telling me 
that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. And it just happened two months ago. That's when I found out about it. It's like, oh, oh, by the way, uh, son. Yeah, that's, that's pretty yeah, cool. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, being from, you know, Chicagoland area, how do you end up at Ohio State? Like, I'm sure playing basketball, you probably had a, you know, at some level options to play, um, but not, you know, maybe not at the D1 level being recruited. So um, yeah, how do you end up in Columbus? Yeah, so um, of course it all comes back to my mom again. Uh, my mom grew up in Ohio. She, she's from Toledo, Ohio. Um, she went to Ohio State. Her siblings went to Ohio State. Her parents went to Ohio State. All her cousins, all her aunts, all her uncles, everyone went to Ohio State. So needless to say, I grew up a huge Ohio State fan. Um, the one of like six, it seemed like, in the North Shore. And uh, I, I was always a huge Ohio State fan, obviously for football, for basketball. I still like worshipped guys like, like I said before, guys like Aaron Kraft, John Diebler, Jared Sollinger. Like those were my favorite players growing up. Like, yeah, I love the Bulls, but like the Ohio State guys were the guys that I really could, you know, relate to a little bit more. Um, and so I grew up a huge Ohio State fan. That was always the dream um, to play, to, to go to Ohio State first and foremost. But then if I could play there, I mean, that's just ridiculous. So um, I had a really good high school career. Um, I was very under-recruited. Um, just because I didn't play a ton my junior year. Um, there were a lot of seniors on the team um, that coach kind of, that our coach kind of gave the nod to um, over me. I mean, like I, I scored like, just to put it in perspective, I scored like 50 points my entire junior year. So like, I'm not exaggerating. Like I really just didn't play. Um, so then I kind of came out of nowhere to everyone else, to, to all my close friends and coaches. They knew I was really, really good, but um, to the rest of the world, I kind of came out of nowhere my senior year when I, we ended up winning our conference. Uh, I was all state, all area, all conference, all that good stuff, which, you know, doesn't really matter anymore. But at the time, it was really, really special. Um, but basically, how I got to Ohio State was I went to a team camp with my, my Deerfield High School team the summer going into my senior year. Um, we went there and we kicked all the butts of all the Ohio teams that were put in front of us. We beat um, the, the state runner-ups the year before. We beat um, Khalil Iverson's team, um, who obviously went on to Wisconsin. Uh, we beat Mark Loving's old high school team that was always, always at the top. And they, they, they basically, um, the coaches ended up watching us because they were like, who is this Illinois team that is kicking all these Ohio teams, um, kicking, kicking their butts? Like, we need to watch them. And the first day we played um, not good teams. The second days they tried to put us through the ringer and we ended up winning the tournament. Uh, so um, that's kind of how they saw me play. Um, one of the coaches introduced himself to me and said, Hey, uh, really like your game. We see a lot of, I see a lot of myself in you and I just want to help you out in your recruiting process in any way, shape or form. It was not at all. Hey, we're going to offer you a scholarship. We're going to offer you a spot here, you know, stay in touch, blah, blah, blah. It was, no, it was, um, I want to help you with your D2 um, looks. I want to help you find the best division three school. Um, I want to be a resource for you type of deal. So um, basically that relationship was great and he helped me out a ton. And then eventually I said, Hey coach, uh, just so you know, my dream is to go to Ohio State. And he goes, okay, well, we can look into that. Um, so I kept sending them film, and they would watch me play. And, and Coach Mata would, for some reason, he would watch the game film of, of this six-foot white guy from uh, Deerfield, um, Illinois, who was not on his radar. And then eventually they, they offered me a spot, and obviously that was something I just couldn't refuse. Yeah, I will say, you know, listen to that story. Like, that's what I imagine my basketball career always going like. Because I was kind of like you, like, you know, not – not a great uh, player, you know, I never was a great player, but didn't really make an impact on my senior year. And I was always like, man, just get on a walk-on squad somewhere at like Illinois or Northwestern or something. Uh, didn't work out that way, but I'm glad that, that somebody got to live that dream. So it's awesome hearing you tell that story. Um, and then just, you know, being at Ohio State, how does one stand out as a walk-on after what Mark Titus did there? You know, like <laughs> does somebody with that stature – having done it like seven or eight years before and made a national name for himself with the book and the blog, does it make it easier or harder to like shine in that spotlight? Uh, it's so funny you say that because obviously anyone with a brain would know that as soon as I got there, everyone's like, Mark Titus this, Mark Titus that, you got, you're going to be the next Titus, blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, I knew Mark because I was a Ohio State fan, but like I didn't go there thinking like, how can I be the next Titus? I had way more important things on my mind, like how am I going to make it through the first conditioning workout or how am I going to find my first class, you know, and stuff like that. So definitely a part of me was, I knew I was going to Ohio State because it could give me a platform to be um, someone that leaves a legacy and then sets himself up for the rest of his life in whatever profession he tries to be. And that was definitely 
part of the reason why I really wanted to go to Ohio State. But when I got there and I realized, like, I'm the only walk-on for some reason, for some reason people, like, would die for all the walk-ons on the teams. Um, so I definitely have to take advantage of this opportunity. And I do remember the first time I got in, I shot, and everyone was like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to shoot. Like, you're not – you're supposed to get a trillion. Like, people are tweeting at me, like, Joey Lane's first trillion, no chance about it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm going in there, like, I'm trying to get my shots up. Like, I don't get opportunities like this every game. So I'm going to try and score. And then also, um, I'm not the next Mark Titus. I'm the first Joey Lane, you know. And, and Titus will be the first person to say, you know, he loves that, that I want nothing to do with him. Uh, and we used to talk about that all the time. You know, I would ask, I would ask all these questions and he would give me these ridiculous answers. And, um, you know, we got to be good buddies because he was actually a Cubs fan just like me. So, um, you know, we would talk all the time, never about basketball, never about being a walk-on, but um, we got to be good friends. And, and it, 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 it's fun that I had my own little shtick. He had his own little shtick. We can relate to each other. Um, and we became really good friends. But yeah, I, I looked, I didn't look at it like trying to fill Mark's shoes. I more looked at it like, how can I make a name for Joey Lane? Yeah, and, you know, a couple of things that stood out, uh, just remembering your days and then following up with some Google searches before the interview. Uh, obviously, the smoke nicknames in your in your Twitter handle, and then there's towel gang as well. So tell me about those two monikers, how did they kind of come to life? Yeah, so uh, smoke was a nickname given to me the day I was born by my dad. Uh, he had a really good friend growing up named Joe that they called Smoke and Joe uh, after Smoke and Joe Frazier. So I grew up as smoke. Uh, all my friends called me smoke. My parents called me smoke, my sister, my, my, I mean, my friend's parents, like I was never Joey. Like I was smoke or, or Joe to coaches, like coaches did, they didn't love the whole smoke thing really. So um, I was always smoke when I got to school. Um, I remember coach Bowles um, brought me into his office and asked me like, why, why do people call you smoke? Like that's in your Twitter handle. Like why I explained it. So then he started calling me smoke and coach Dickerson from that old staff, um, the only one who wouldn't besides coach Mata, um, was coach, uh, Paulus, uh, GP. He would, he, he was like, I'm not calling you smoke. Sorry, dude. Like that's not, I don't, I don't get it. So, um, but yeah, I've been smoked for my whole life. My teammates, I mean, like, I just think of like JT and Kata when they call me still to these day to this day, like they answer the phone and they're like, smoke, what's up? Like, you know, it's just, it's very funny to me like that a childhood nickname has stuck with me for so long and I don't go up to people and introduce myself as smoke. It's like it organically comes up some way, somehow. So even when like the new guys come in, like Keyshawn Woods, when he came in, like he was calling me smoke from like day three. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. I love how Paulus just said he didn't get it. So he just flat out refused to do it. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just not in his DNA to call people by nicknames. Tell me about uh, the towel gang then. How did that come about? Yeah. So that all started as just like, away from my family to pick me out on TV. Um, I, I guess I was too naive to understand that it's pretty easy to find the white guy at the end of the bench on TV, but um, I wanted to make it crystal clear and have that towel around my neck so that people knew. And then in addition to that, it's also a great prop for celebrating and stuff. You know, it really gets, gets people going. So that's kind of how I started wearing a towel around my neck. Um, and then one of my buddies who actually was a walk on in Maryland, Andrew Terrell, he kind of, posted on Instagram one time, tagged me, and was like, towel gang. I was like, that's got some legs. So we kind of ran with it. He kind of said, you know, I'm fine with being, being the brains. Like, you, you do your thing, you know. So we were the, we're the co-founders, right? So, um, and basically, he kind of has realized that it's kind of my thing now, and he's kind of stayed away from it, which is fine. He's, he's the man. I, he's got a podcast, too. Um, but – uh, yeah, it, it kind of grew a mind of its own. It was like, just like Club Trillion, you know, I wasn't writing a blog, but it was just something that people like identified me with. And like, I'd be walking on campus and people come up to me like, where's your towel? And I'm like, are you, are you serious? Like, that's not that funny. I'm, I'm late for class. Like, it's nice to see you. Goodbye. You know? So um, it, it was, it's cool. You know, like it's, I was signing stuff. People were like, please, can you sign like hashtag towel gang? And I was like signing stuff with hashtag towel gang. I was like, that is going to be worth so much less now that I'm doing that, but I'm happy to do it. So yeah, it was just, it was cool to have something like that, that everyone knew, knew about me. Like even when I come back to campus now, it's like, Oh, like the towel guy. Right. It's like, yeah, I guess I am the towel guy. So I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. I remember Andrew from Maryland and uh, the other walk on 
you know, we're talking white guys under the bench, really popular fan favorites. Uh, it was Tommy Luce of Purdue. So do you guys ever, like he, he got so much, so much pub and, and uh, you know, I know we, we would always share some stuff on social media surrounding him too. Um, do you guys like ever kind of side eye each other? Like, all right, you know, did, did, did Tommy or uh, Terrell get in um, and, and get a bucket? Like how, how does the whole walk on fraternity work? I, I'll say this with my really good friends that are walk-ons, we would never guard each other because the worst thing that could happen would be one of us score on each other. And that would be the worst thing. All the trash talk in the world would happen. I remember when Tommy checked in one time that I was playing, I told uh, um, the other walk on Danny Hummer that was in with me. I was like, you got him. I'll get the other guy. Like I was a fr- I mean, like, I don't want to get scored on by the walk on. That's when the crowd is the loudest, you know? So, um, I've been on the other end of it. I remember at Rutgers, I don't know who their walk-on was, but he was guarding me and I scored and it was so loud. Like I felt so, I mean, I, not at the time, I didn't feel bad for him, but I realized like that's demoralizing. Like I don't, it doesn't matter if, if you think they're a great player or not, like the guy you're guarding, it sucks to get scored on. So um, yeah, I mean, I never got to play against Andrew, which kind of stunk. That would have been fun. But like Jack Hoiberg um, at Michigan state is one of my really, really close friends. We worked out together for years back here. And when he scored against us, I wasn't guarding him. Uh, when he scored against us, I was like, I can't cheer. I'm so happy for him, but, like, I can't cheer. So there's that aspect of it, too. Um, if if coach tells me to guard some guy, I'm going to guard him. But, you know, I remember, like, we played Gonzaga, and I have a good friend on Gonzaga who was playing against me. He's like, okay, I want to guard him. Like, this is – we'll never get a chance to play against each other again. You know, so I, I'm basically just giving you a bunch of answers to that question. But – me and Tommy, we weren't – I've never really talked to him before. Um, but some of the other guys, I think there is some sort of unwritten rule that is, like, don't guard each other because we want to score. And we know that you're in there trying to impress and stuff, so you're going to take it super, super seriously and stuff, you know. So we don't want to butt heads at all. So that's kind of where I'll leave it, I guess. Yeah, baseball has unwritten rules, and it's like the, the walk-on unwritten rules put those to shame. So, you know, we – we uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you pulling the curtain back a little bit on those. Um so you are, you know, you left enough of a legacy and, and uh, you know, add enough of a brand to now be on Cameo. I saw you have a Cameo page set up. So have you done any uh, any funny ones, any over-the-top Cameos for anyone? Yeah, I've done – first, let me get it – let me make things clear. I was asked to do a Cameo – asked to be on Cameo because they wanted to get the rest of the Ohio State guys, and I was just kind of the, the main contact point. And I felt – I didn't, it didn't feel right going and asking people, like, to join on – I was like – I'm not going to do that. If they want to join, like they can ask me what I think about these efforts, but that's why they wanted me. Um, granted, I've been able to, to do a bunch, which is insane. And I don't understand why people want videos of me, but some funny ones have been like guys. Um, some guy will, will write in and say that his friend's a gambling addict and like tell, tell me to, to explain to him, like, you know, that it's okay. And that eventually he'll win and stuff like that. Um, I've had people ask me to just bash other schools which depending on the school I will do. Um, and, and some people will write in and, and tell me to like talk really nice about Penn state or something. And like those, I literally won't do like, I'll, I'll make them and send them in, but they'll have nothing to do with what they told me to say. Um, like I remember I, it's someone was like, I'm a huge Ohio state fan. So I thought of you. Um, but uh, my buddy Rick is a Penn state fan. Can you talk about how he, you think that Penn state's going to be really good in football next year? I'm like, I'm not going to lie to Rick, you know? So um <laughs> So yeah, I've had, I've had some funny ones. A lot of them are, are happy birthdays, which is fun. It's just like, it's just like, Hey, happy birthday. I know you couldn't think of a more random person to get a happy birthday from, but, but here we are, you know? So um, it's kind of fun. It's, it's, it's a great little side hustle. Like it's just like, I sit in, I remember like I sit in my basement, wait till they're one day to be due, throw on a hat and say, go bucks. And people give me money. It's insane. It's just, that's the dream for every student athlete. 100%. 100%. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so what would you say your, you know, your best personal moment as a Buckeye was? Like, whether it's a bucket or, or you know, just getting in a game or something from the sidelines, uh, what jumps out at you? I think uh, I, I can give, like, three different answers to that. Um, I think my best moment as a Buckeye, just making the NCAA tournament, was really, really cool. Um, it was just real, the atmosphere and everything, both years. Um, winning games, just so, so unbelievably cool. It's just that's every kid's dream who grows up watching basketball is to play in the NCAA tournament. So to get to do that, first and foremost, 
so awesome. And we had, I mean, we had every kind of win. We had the win where we were supposed to win and the win where we were not supposed to win close games. Like it's just, just awesome. Um, not in the moment because I was scared for my life basically, but afterwards, unbelievable feeling. Um, I think another really cool moment was um, at Purdue uh, when Kata, Kata Bates the up had that buzzer beater to win. That was just the coolest atmosphere that I've ever been in. It went from the loudest I've ever heard to the quietest I've ever heard a stadium within 10 seconds. So that's, I think, one individual, those are just some individual moments where it's not me being on the court. It's almost like me being a fan. Um, that was really, really cool. Um, I think in terms of my basketball career, um, getting to start um, against Wisconsin on senior night, that was really cool. That game was just insane because it went from five minutes left. I'm like, oh, shoot, I got to tie my shoes because I'm going to have to play at the end and it's my last game and I'm going to cry and all this stuff and it stinks. And then, oh, my God, we're coming back and we're going to win and then we lose and now I got to make a speech and cry in front of everyone. So that was just the ultimate emotions beyond starting that game and having a shot go in and out to start the game. Um, just the craziest roller coaster of emotions in that game. Um, and then just, I don't know, like – Playing in St. John Arena, there's something special about that. Um, and I had an, an, a really, really good game uh, for me personally. I, I hit a three, had a couple assists, two steals, like like pick six steals, which were really cool, which I didn't even get in high school, let alone in college. Um, so that was really special. I think I can – I'm just the kind of guy that remembers everything about everything. Like I could tell you every game that I've played in, every game that I haven't played in, the score, who played well. It's just – it's a blessing and a curse. Um, I mean, like the Maryland game at home my junior year when we just beat the daylights out of them and Dockage played great in the first half. And then I came in the second half and had a shot fake sidestep dribble three-pointer. Like I didn't have that in me. I just pulled that out of nowhere, you know? So just stuff like that. I mean, I'll remember for the rest of my life. There's just too – I mean, there's too many moments to, to, to look back on. Yeah, that's why I like have a hard time believing all the guys who say they don't know how many they had in the game or don't remember certain plays. Like I was the same way. I remembered every type of play I was involved in. Um, and then I, I also vividly remembered your uh, win over Purdue that, that night because it was on BTN. It was a huge like ranked matchup. And on the podcast that night on this show, I, I interviewed uh, Kevin Kiermeyer, who's a huge Purdue fan, plays for the Tampa Bay Rays, like, like live or die Purdue fan. And after that game happened, I was like, is this, still, is this dude still going to want to, like, come on the show? Like, is he going to be just, like, absolutely furious? And he, credit to him, he came on and was, like, super gracious, but he was crushed that he, they lost that game. So. I can only imagine. Yeah, I can so, only imagine. That was crazy. Um, all right, before we wrap up, I, you know, I want to get kind of your big picture look at the program um, right now. First of all, you, you know, I, your pin tweet remains to this day uh, – a heartfelt message, and then it, it, you close it out with Ohio State basketball is back. I think that was after Holtman's first season at Ohio State. So, um, you know, what went into that, and, and how do you feel about the direction of the program and the trajectory since the end of the 2018 season, uh, now that Holtman's going into year four? Yeah, you know, in regards to that tweet, um, I just remember at the beginning of the year, obviously, like, did I want to see Coach Mata go? Absolutely not. I mean, that guy – I owe my entire basketball career to him because he gave me a chance and let me live out my dream. Um, obviously, Coach Holman coming in was the best thing that could happen. I mean, I love him the same way I love Coach Mata in regards to they, I mean, they let me be me and, and they will, I mean, they have the biggest impact on my life um, that anyone's had beyond my parents and grandparents, you know? So um, I think a lot of people didn't quite understand what we were getting in Coach Holman. I think the team didn't quite know until – um, you know, we start practice, we start playing like this guy is, is legit, as legit as it comes. And we are so excited to, to, to play under him. Um, so we had in our mind, you know, the past four years, basically for Ohio State had been not up to expectations. So we were the team that was going to turn it around. And um, on the backs of guys like Kata Bates, the up and Jay Shantae, we did it. And um, once you get to that point, it's like, there's no return. You know, we're not going back to the days my freshman and sophomore year, basically, where we weren't even fighting. We weren't fighting for Big Ten championships. We weren't even fighting for NCAA tournament appearances, you know. So um, that's kind of what happened with that tweet. It was like, all right, we were gone for a little bit, but now we're back and we're here to stay. Um, and it continued my senior year. It definitely continued last year. And I just can't say enough how good a hands um, Ohio State is in with um, Coach Holtman. Obviously, the football program's in incredible hands with Coach Day. I think it's the same kind of level. Um, you know, I, I think that 
Gene Smith is the best athletic director in the country. And he is so awesome in terms of, of helping out um, in whatever way he can and making sure we have all the tools to be successful. Um, and I can't, I just, I, I I'm so excited about to, to see where this program goes. I know that, um, you know, it's tough when you see guys transferring every year um, to think some, some negative thoughts, but just understand that um, Ohio state is in incredible hands. Uh, and it was so weird for me to be a fan this past year, but I'm excited now this year that I have a year under my belt um, to be a fan next year. So um, I'm just, I mean, overjoyed with the direction the program is going in. I love every single person that's a part of the program from the staff down to the players. Um, and, and of course the managers who are the hardest working guys uh, in, in college sports. So um, couldn't be more excited for the future. All right. Very well put. I would close it out right there with that, uh, with that inspiring note, but since you're from Chicago, you know, uh, I'm a Chicago guy now. I do want to do some rapid fire, like Chicago land stereotype questions love it. Just to see where you stand. Um, all right. So the first one's obvious. It's almost too cliche, but are you a deep dish or thin crust guy? See, you think it's cliche, but I'll give you an answer that you're not expecting. If I, it's hard to say I'm a deep dish guy just because it's, it's, it's a little ridiculous. You know, it's, it's not pizza. You know, it's like a, it's like a open face sandwich. So I, my favorite thing is I love getting thin crust from deep dish restaurants because they know how to make pizza, obviously. So like Lou Malnati's, which is my favorite pizza in the world, they're deep dish, incredible. Nothing I'd rather have more in terms of deep dish, but their thin crust is out of this world. So I'll throw a wrench in there and say I'm a thin crust guy. All right. That was going to be my next question is which Chicago pizza spot. Uh, glad you cleared that up. Um, I also big Lou's fan, but for thin crust, I got to go. I don't know if you've had D'Agostino's um, in Chicago. That's that thin crust is, is so good. And uh, their sausage is something like something special and unique that I highly recommend. Right. Um, no. Yeah. We'll stick on the food, uh, food line of questioning. Are you, if you had to pick one of these restaurants to go to, you know, the, only one can stay open. I was going to say, is it Al's beef or Portillo's? Oh, it's not even close for me. Portillo's. All right. I, I love, that's my favorite question ever. It's, it, it's, it's, Portillo's is, the pinnacle of fast casual dining. It's really good. And then I'm kind of mad because uh, Champagne got a Portillo's like the year after I moved away. Oh, so yeah, that's, a, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's a bummer. Brutal. Um, all right, you already, I, I think you mentioned it earlier, you're our Cubs fan. So um, is that just a family lineage thing or why, why the Cubs? Yeah, my, I grew up for like the first three years of my life. Yeah. Cause I remember them so well um, on the North side of Chicago. Um, so I just, Grew up around Wrigley Field, and my, my dad could care less about sports – or not sports, I shouldn't say sports, about baseball. Um, but he's a Cubs fan also. My uncle, on the other hand, is a Sox fan. All my cousins are Sox fans. So it's a little weird, but I'm a Cubs fan just because, like, I, they're, I like the colors. I like Wrigley Field. I, I, I don't know. There's just something about the Cubs that I always gravitated towards. And since I was old enough to make my own decisions on which team I liked, I, I've been a Cubs fan. Yeah, I'm a big Cubs fan as well. And and living in walking distance to Wrigley Field has always been like a semi requirement for me when I'm picking apartments in Chicago. Um, all right, so you are you a Metro or a L train guy? Because I live in the suburbs now, I'm a Metro guy. Um, whenever I whenever I need to go downtown, uh, I worked in the city last summer, um, and I was a Metro guy. Uh, I had coworkers who were who were who were the opposite, um, but it's just. Without the Metro, I couldn't be able to go from the suburbs of Chicago to Chicago in 35 minutes. So I'm a Metro guy. All right, last one. What's your favorite Chicago uh, tourist attraction? Uh, I will say Navy Pier is at the bottom of it for me. I just don't get it. I think that, yeah, you got to do it. You got to do it. But for me, it's just not worth it almost. Like you go to it once. That's it. It's a tourist trap for sure. Exactly. And then near the bottom but not at the bottom is the beam because i mean like that's just i mean that's just nobody in chicago goes to the beam it's just if unless you're like eating lunch out there or something but like i'm not going to be like okay i'm going to the beam to take pictures of the beam and spend time looking at the beam you know so that's like another one that's just for me it does nothing living in chicago it, it got a little cooler though because it's in the it's in Drake's latest album, I'll say, and that one right. song. It, it, it definitely went up a notch, but at the same time, if they say, like, 2.30, meet me at the Bean, like, nobody says that in Chicago. So, right. <laughs> um, 
But number one for me, and we've already talked about it, is Wrigley Field. I mean, if you've never sat in the bleachers for a noon game in Wrigley Field, then you haven't experienced one of the best things in sports. Agreed. Yeah, I regularly uh, go on runs around Wrigley down, you know, past the outfield. And it's just so weird being empty in, you know, the middle of summer. So hopefully, hopefully we can get back there soon and hopefully we get back to sports soon. And the first thing that uh, is on the docket, like we talked about, is the TBT. So I'm excited. Joe, appreciate you uh, taking some time out, man. Uh, you know, really enjoyed you running through your, your career and also enjoyed your expertise on the TBT. So we'll be, we'll be watching and um, best of luck going forward, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. This was a blast. Thanks for having me on. Um, love it. So go, go Big Ten. Go Buckeyes. All right. Thanks once again to Joey for joining me. Appreciate him giving me so much of his time. Um, you know, that, that's not just promotion. I really am excited to see some real live basketball really soon. Um, TBT's always been an awesome event just to, one, take up some time in the summer, but also, you know, see guys like we talked about in the interview, see guys play that you maybe haven't seen in a while, and the quality of basketball really is high level. So um, excited to, to see one, if, you know, the Ohio State Carmen's crew team can defend their title. Uh, excited to see the Illinois team and a lot of guys I went to school with compete and also all the other guys from the Big Ten and beyond that uh, Joey mentioned earlier. So, once again, appreciate him. Thanks to everyone out there for listening. Um, continue to keep episodes coming at a, a semi-regular cadence throughout the summer. And thank you, as always, to people who have subscribed or rated left reviews um, on our platforms, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Podbean, um, and our full videos now that we're doing all these on Zoom are available on YouTube. If you want to go to the Big Ten Network's YouTube channel, there's a whole Take 10 playlist, and you can see these interviews in their entirety with our guests. So I encourage you to do so. And I just want to give a shout out before we close it out to... Julie Bronder, my producer, as always, for stitching the show together. And one more thank you to everyone for listening. We'll talk to everyone soon here on the Take 10 Podcast.